Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac... Well, this sounds like kind of low. Let me turn it up just a touch. Let's talk about Alaska. But first, as always, now it sounds kind of high. What is happening with my... There we go. Sorry. Sorry. See, this is what happens when I take like eight days off. It gets all kinds of wonky on me, and I don't change any settings between the shows. It's not like I'm using this for like, you know... DJing or, you know, singing songs or anything. But for some reason, settings get changed and it drives me crazy, but we're here. Let's do the shout outs real quick. We got shout outs for all the patrons. Head on over to patreon.com slash paranormal almanac. Shout outs to Gary, Tracy, Matthew, Sandy, Kelly, Joe, Menace the Beast, Kick-Ass, Magic, Robot, Webcomic, Sandy, Page, Couch, Sean, Andrew, Scott, Andrea, Devin, Melody, Ricardo, Vicky, Christopher, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam, Roger, Michael, Terminal Animal, Alicia, Becca, Elizabeth, Voitech, Sherry, Art Muffin, Trudy, Tim. Hey, howdy, hi, Tim. I haven't talked to you in a little bit. Uh, Paul, Ricardo, Ian, Jen, Alexandra, George, Connie, Seth, Jason, Cindy, Kim, Ashley, what's that? Carrie, Ezra, Robin. Will, Lauren and Phil Mangano, Russell, April, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Bob, the Sean Bishop, hey, howdy, hi, Stacy, Paula, Jerry, Leo, Scustin, Lindsay, Hahn, Megan, Matt, Amy, Jeff, Tease, Harley, Suzanne, Joe, Lawrence, the Lauren Strawn, hey, howdy, hi, Veronica, Autumn, J. Mark, Manning, Carolyn, Martin, Matt, Jade, Nanashi, Chuck, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Dan, Laura, Pitts, and Gamer Fan. With two special shout outs, as always, to Joe Teague and Stitch. All right, the next thing I got to talk to you about before we really get into this episode is merch. Because I'm going crazy making shirts. Like, a wacky amount of shirts. And not just shirts, but everything you can think of for merch. But if you head on over to tpublic.com slash store slash Paranormal Almanac, or just look up Paranormal Almanac on T uh, Public, you'll find all of the shirts. I've got Shadow People shirts, I've got Witches shirts, and I've got Skinwalker Ranch shirts, and I got... Loch Ness shirts and Don't F and Shoot Bigfoot shirts and the Paramaniac shirts and you name it. I have got a variety of shirts and masks and mugs and I don't know, all kinds of like wall art and all kinds of crap they got on there. It's very cool, if I do say so myself, which I am right now. So head on over there for all your merch needs. Alrighty, let's get right on in to Paranormal News because there is a lot to get to. Ghost in demons that haunt the night Strange objects fly through the sky Shadow people are spending the night again Black eyed children knock on my door A portal to hell opens in my room It's time travel man says the world is changing Don't fucking shoot Bigfoot. Boy, that one makes me happy. That one makes me happy. I love it. All right, the first story in paranormal news is... River Troll photographed in Mississippi? This was a cheesy one, but I love these kind of stupid ones. It was sent over uh, via fan, via, via listener. They said there was an alleged river troll that was photographed in Mississippi. It went to Unexplained Mysteries, their Twitter account, and there's a photo that says a family who lived on a houseboat once captured a strange image in the waters of coastal Mississippi. At best, it looks like two eyes peeking out of the water, but uh, it could literally be anything. So I'm going to read you the replies real quick to see what people think it is. 
They said it's a Pokemon of a cloister. Oh, for frack's sake, it's the root bundle of a tipped over tree in the background. Look, you can even see that it's mirrored on the water surface. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that statement. Kind of looks like a panther, but who knows? Still weird. No, it doesn't. All the phone technology, and this still looks like a flip phone picture, kind of. And then more and more stupid stuff. But yeah, it is definitely not a river troll. And why would you pick that one? Out of all the things to pick, they chose river troll. All righty, up next in paranormal news, slightly more paranormal. Alien life, is there anyone out there? Scientists sending new messages to space. If alien life is out there in this great big universe, we're doing our best to reach it with a new message. And this time it's got some algebra attached, just in case they're big on math. NASA is partnering with some of the partnering with some of the country's top scientific minds in hopes of broadcasting a new radio message via a high-tech telescope very similar to what we did in 1974 from Arecibo in Puerto Rico. Not to get all mathy on you. Oh, hi Rum, how are you? Thank you. I love you too. Not to get all mathy on you, but the messages to the stars only include binary code plus some images of our solar system and DNA sequences. This time we're calling it the Beacon in the Galaxy message. And we're kicking things up a notch by transmitting math equations. There will be another graphical information communicating some basic principles and features of our world, including cosmic landmarks that could help aliens find Earth in the Milky Way. Yeah, sounds great. Um, Let's do it. I don't even care anymore. I'm not even going to be like, maybe we shouldn't be contacting them because they're obviously more of an advanced civilization and they can kill Screw that crap. Let's do it. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, 2022 and 23 will be bad. Oh, gee, that'd be terrible. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news, another very quick one, but I wanted to add it because I like the photo of it. They say a, oh, good Lord, my ad blocker is on. Here we go. They say that uh, a Yeti head and Bigfoot prints will be on display at a new Bangor shop. The International Cryptozoology Museum just opened its new Bangor outpost on Hammond Street this week after first announcing the bookstore and gift shop late last fall. And Big- Bigfoot hunters, paranormal enthusiasts, and merely curious have already stopped by to visit. I really want to go to this place. Uh, let's see. Cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman, uh, executive director of the nonprofit that runs the flagship museum in Portland, and now the Bangor location has packed the shop with artifacts, specimens, and curiosities alongside books and gifts and an archive full of Coleman's thousands of books on cryptozoology, and associated topics, which people will be able to uh, visit by appointment, which could be open, which will be open later this year. We'd hope to have it open by Halloween of last year, but we really wanted to get things right and find some unique items for Bangor. We found some artifacts that uh, really spoke to this area. Now they do have some casts of footprints. There's the Fiji mermaid, the fake one, obviously. There is the Cherry Field Goat Man. Fake, obviously, which is a half-human, half-goat wearing a flannel shirt who was supposedly spotted in the Washington County town in the 1950s. They have Frosty, a huge sculpture of a Yeti head that's mounted to the wall. Very, very neat looking. A replica of the Minnesota Iceman, which is a six-foot hairy hominid, originally believed to have been found in Vietnam, which is not if you listen to that episode. Uh, Let's see. They go on to say that... um, Yeah, that's about it. I'm going to get on to the next one. There's a lot of neat stuff. Go check it out. Honestly, just go check out... If you're in Bangor, Maine, please go check out the International Cryptozoology Museum. It's on Hammond Street. Uh, That's all it says. It's on Hammond Street. Go check it out. Find it. Google is your friend. Up next in paranormal news. This student society is searching swamps for Sasquatch. That's right. Trent University Sasquatch Society boasts some 140 Squatchers. Good on them. These kids are awesome. Sabrina Marie is hovering over a pile of feces trying to figure out who left it here. She suspects a dog or a raccoon and is quick to rule out it as Sasquatch scat. I'm assuming it would be much larger than that, she said. Marie would know she's in charge of the social media for the Trent University Sasquatch Society, an official club with some 140 Squatchers. It's registered with the school student union, sandwiched between other groups like the Trent Conservatives, the Badminton Club, and the Model UN. I've been really interested in otherworldly stuff and cryptozoology, so I thought it was an awesome opportunity, said Marie, a fourth-year biology student at the school, located in Peterborough, Ontario, 68 kilometers northeast of Toronto. So if you guys are listening, if anybody from this uh, Trent University Sasquatch Society are listening, please reach out to me. I'd love to have you on the show. I'd love to talk to you. I think this is awesome. They said the group uh, searched a swamp outside Petersboro, where club founder and president Ryan Willis was told mysterious footprints were found. He likes, or he likes, no, he brings a stick to knock knock on trees and try to elicit a response, as well as a portable Bigfoot noisemaker 
To reference any howls, snorts, roars, or groans he may hear. His eyes are peeled for oversized tracks or peculiar tree structures. A lot of the experts we talk to say that you should, you should keep returning to the same areas, and I like that idea. I think that's really smart. Willis, a fourth-year Canadian studies uh, student, study student, Canadian study student at Trent, has long been obsessed with the lore around Sasquatch and Bigfoot. I probably prefer to call it Sasquatch because I think it kind of sounds most professional. Sometimes you say Bigfoot and people go, ha ha, Bigfoot. Yeah, they do. They really do. But he's yet to spot something suspicious, and the recent swamp search didn't turn up anything either. But that's no surprise to Trent anthropology professor Eugene Morin, who scoffs at the notion Sasquatch are trudging any forest. In term of ecology, it doesn't make any sense. Well, you are wrong, Eugene. How can you say that? How can you definitively say that it doesn't make any sense? It 100% makes sense. Gigantopithecus. No, thank you. Uh, let's see. He goes on to say a pool of mates is needed to sustain a population of mammals. He says if Sasquatch did exist, there would have been many more sightings and proof of mates, especially given the reported size. Nuh-uh. When was the silverback gorilla officially classified versus when were there theories and stories from the late, the, the, the natives and villagers about it? No, no, no. He says, I think it's fun. Eh. It's probably entertaining, but like UFOs, I think UFOs in my opinion are most likely it's probably entertaining, but it's like UFOs. I think UFOs, in my opinion, are more likely to be real. Well, yeah, we know they're real. Ugh. But this guy, this kid goes on to say there's a lot of stigma around coming out and saying you saw a Sasquatch. Yep. Talking to those who have had encounters keeping, keeps him believing. It's murkier for other society members like Allison Adam, a third-year business student who recently joined. I'm not ruling it out. I'd maybe have to see one to really know for sure. Yes, exactly. Matthew Moneymaker, one of the hosts of Finding Bigfoot, was intrigued when asked to speak to the Trent Group. He only knows one other school society dedicated to searching for the legendary beast at a university in Virginia. Hey, Virginia kids, same deal. Call me or email me or write to me, whatever you want to do. Get get to me, basically. He hopes they take off in more places. All these kids are very interested in it. They're having a lot of fun. Rad. He does admit that Ontario is not the squatchiest place and encourages Trent students to stick to places where sightings have already been reported. Just randomly going out, looking in the woods around the campus, it's like, that's ridiculous, he said. I hope this group can get organized enough to find out where the nearest reports are. They can spend some time out there at night, just like I did in law school. I love it. Keep it up, kids. That's freaking awesome. I, I like everything about those guys. And there's a lots of Bigfoot merch in my uh, T Public thingy. Also, don't fucking shoot Bigfoot. Kids are not kids. Up next in paranormal news, UFOs left radiation burns and unaccounted for pregnancies. New Pentagon port report claims. Oh, Pentagon report claims. 1,500 pages of UFO-related research were just declassified as of a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, I got to really skip through because it's the same shit that we already know about. The cache of documents include reports on the biological effect of UFO sightings on humans, studies on advanced technology such as invisibility cloaks and plans for deep space exploration and colonization. Some portion of the documents were withheld in part for privacy and confidentiality. One standout document from the collection is a report called Anomalous Acute and Subacute Field Effects on Human and Biological Tissues, dated March 2010. The report describes alleged injuries to human observers by anomalous advanced aerospace systems, some of which may be a threat to United States interests. The report describes 42 cases from medical files and 300 unpublished cases where humans sustained injuries after alleged encounters with anomalous vehicles, which include UFOs. In some of these cases, humans showed burn injuries and other conditions related to electromagnetic radiation, some of them appearing to have been afflicted by energy-related propulsion systems. The report also noted cases of brain damage, nerve damage, heart palpitations, and headaches related to anomalous vehicle encounters. That is awesome. I love it. More and more. Yeah, keep telling me that UFOs aren't real. All of these reports are saying otherwise. And this next one, the same thing. USO, USO, US warships were chased. This says was chased. Was chased. U.S. warships were chased by two car-sized balls of light UFOs. A U.S. Navy warship was shadowed by two car-sized balls of light that were unaffected by anti-drone weapons, it claimed. The USS 
Kearsarge, K-E-A-R-K-E-A-R-S-A-R-G-E, USS Kearsarge. No idea. It's the latest vehicle to reportedly been uh, to reportedly have a UFO encounter as the U.S. military begins to open up about the mysterious phenomena. Documentary filmmaker Dave C. Beatty, who produced 2019 The Nimitz Encounters, uh, revealed the reported sightings from October 2021. At least two objects are said to have lurked near the 40,500-ton amphibious assault ship for several nights while it was on training exercises, exercises off the coast of the United States. The phenomena, described by sources familiar with the encounter as odd and menacing balls of light, are said to have been followed around have been following around a half mile behind the ship and around 200 feet above the ocean. He was contacted by a now retired U.S. Marine officer identified only as Mark regarding the strange episode. The USS Kearsarge has been training at the time ahead of a overseas ahead of an overseas deployment, including with systems designed to take down enemy drones. The weapons include anti-drone Ghostbuster-style backpacks, that's awesome, and systems mounted on vehicles. Pictures from the ship's public Facebook page reveal that they had these capabilities on board at the time of the alleged encounter. The objects are said to have been spotted at night by the deck watch, who could not gain a thermal targeting lock on them. It is understood the incident was recorded on video by the crew, but this footage has not yet been released. Marines on board are said to have believed it are said to have believed at first the unexplained objects were part of a surprise training exercise for the new anti-drone weapons. Oh, that's interesting. However, they discovered the countermeasures did not disrupt the objects, which were doing swooping maneuvers as they followed the ship. Mark told Beatty that the USS Kearsarge, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced, radioed command about the objects and were informed the objects were, quote, not ours. The documentarian is attempting a deeper dive into the event, which is the latest UFO incident reported uh, by the U.S. Navy. He says he previously revealed deck logs that confirmed a UFO encounter by the USS Kid in 2019, then the Tic Tacs, the Go Fast, the Gimbals, all the stuff that we already know about, but it seems like it's still happening, and now it's happening to another ship. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news, let's keep moving on. We're closing in on them, says UFO expert on Pentagon findings. A newly released Pentagon report says some witnesses reported UFO sightings. I already talked about this. Radiation burns, brain problems, damaged nerves. But the memo from the Defense Intelligence Agency is not the hard evidence needed to confirm life on other planets. Nick Pope, who is a journalist who used to run British government's UFO project, says, We are getting closer than we've ever been. If they're out there, we're closing in on them, and it'll be the biggest discovery in human history. I agree. That's all I need to go from that one. The rest of it kind of mirrors that last report. But, yeah, I completely agree. Up next, more of the same. Unaccounted pregnancy and heart palpitations. Pentagon releases new UFO information. This one goes on to say that the documents are over 1,500 pages of Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program. They said it was made available after a request for a copy by a British newspaper, the report was released by the U.S. Defense, Defense Intelligence Agency, and we will have more on that soon. So even more, expect even more news stories left and right about these uh, these newly released documents, which I want to find and read. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news, the 2022 Edinburgh Out of This World UFO Conference and Festival. This is in, oh, it's not Edinburgh, it's in Edinburgh, sorry, Edinburgh, Texas. It's that time of year again. The city of Edinburgh announces the annual Edinburgh Out of This World UFO Conference and Festival. This year panel, this year's guest panel for 2022 includes Christopher O'Brien, Ken Gerhard, No Tories, Daniel Allen Jones, and more. The three-day festival, April 7th through the 9th. Oh, that's coming up tomorrow. Hey, if you're in the uh, Texas area, Valley Central, Edinburgh, Texas area, and you want to go to this, go to this and uh, let me know. I'll make you our, our on-the-scene reporter. It includes conferences by celebrity UFO speakers from shows like Ancient Aliens and The Vortex. The festival will be full of activities such as a planetarium, tin foil hat stations, vendors, autopsy room, costume contest, and an out-of-this-world laser light show. The festival, festival will also include footage of a UFO sighting in the Rio Grande Valley. The family-friendly festival will take place at the city of Edinburgh City Hall Courtyard on April 8th. Wait, what? 
It says April 7th through the 9th. Now this is saying April 8th in the same news story. At 6 p.m., the festival is free and open to the entire public. Hey, that's cool. Conference tickets are being sold. Uh, those are at, they start at $20, but will increase in price as the conference approaches. So probably has increased in prices by now. So check it out if you're in the area. There's your chance to go to a very cool UFO festival. Last but not least in paranormal news, Mira Sorvino recalls UFO encounter. Now, there's supposed to be videos. Let's see what happens. During an appearance on The Late Show starring James Corden on Monday night to promote our new horror comedy show, Shining Veil, host James asked whether she had any paranormal experiences. In response, she described how she saw a UFO back in 2018. I have seen a UFO for real. There's nothing else to explain it. I woke up in the middle of the night. We were in a rented house in the Malibu Hills after our home was affected by the Woolsey fire. Oh, that's it? I want to know more. Apparently that's it. Let me see what happens if I keep playing this crappy, horrible music. Nope. Lots of funky music. That's all you're going to get. No video. That's a bummer. I was really hoping to hear from her, but that's okay. Let's, uh, let's close up the old paranormal news bag here. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. We are back. And on this edition, I'm still not going to do the werewolf sequel. Ha ha ha. Will it ever come out? Who knows? Probably will, though. Uh, but no, instead, I decided let's keep on keeping on with new stuff. And let's talk about Alaska, the last tundra of America. Is that right? Sure, why not? The final state in America? I think that's right. Or was Hawaii last? I don't know. One of the last states in America. Oh, the American uh, education system is failing me miserably on this one. Look. It's big, it's vast, it's by Russia, it's got a lot of wilderness, a lot of weird crap happens there, but the first one up is about a lake in Alaska that should be a way bigger story because of the amount of batshit weird paranormal stuff that happens here. So uh, let's start the episode crazy with this one. It's about a fishing town called Port Chatham. Some people call it Chatham, but before it was a fishing town, it was a fishing village for the native people. So, let's travel way, way back to the native people's fishing town that was abandoned. And despite what a lot of sites say, no one knows why the first native people fishing village was abandoned. They don't know. But it was abandoned and it remained abandoned until 1787. A lot of sites just go, oh, it was abandoned because of Bigfoot. They were scared of Bigfoot and they ran away. Nah, not so quick. I'm not a frog, you're not a bunny, let's not jump ahead. When the British Royal Navy appeared in 1787, when they showed up, not just appeared, it wasn't magic, when they showed up in 1787 to this little harbor, they actually used it as a port and remained there for a long time before, guess what? They left it abandoned again for unknown reasons. So we got two two so far, two different peoples, both using it as fishing. Sure, why not? Tons of fish up there. Both just abandoning the site for, again, unknown reasons. I'm not going into all the regurgitated crap on the internet. So let's go to the next verified inhabitants. The next verified inhabitants, it was a cannery. It was in the late 1800s. So again, from 1787 to the late 1800s. Then in the early 1900s, This cannery was evacuated or abandoned in 1905. Now, this one does seem to have a little bit of backstory to it. They say that all of the native workers left the area because of, quote, something in the forest. Something big, something hairy, something mean, and something that the native people in that area had been talking about for centuries. Records show, though, that after they all abandoned and took off, they did come back the next year, 1906. Now, is it because the cannery got armed guards like they asked? Maybe. But it's probably because work is few and far between up there, so they had very little choice. But they did come back. They came back in 1906. Now, here are a bunch of stories that I kind of sorted through the years. Some of these are kind of verifiable, others not so much. Finding out about this town, Port Chatham, 
and about the hairy man, as he's about to be known, as you're about to hear about. Uh, he does have a native name that I'll tell you about in a little bit and everything. But uh, finding out reputable witnesses and reputable accounts is very, very difficult. If you just look it up, if you just look up Port Chatham, hairy man, you're going to find the most horrific stories ever. Some kind of dubious, most regurgitated from site to site to site to site. So let's start in the 1920s, about 15 years after the people returned to that cannery. There were stories shared among the locals in the Kenai Peninsula, Peninsula about a creature in Port Chatham. There were also eyewitness, eyewitness stories of a large, hairy creature said to walk on two feet, being seen all around the nearby Chromium mining camp. There were also reports of trees that were completely ripped out of the ground, turned upside down, and put back into the ground with their roots facing straight up in the air. Nothing natural does that. And by natural, I mean it can't be like some weather phenomena. No, something has to rip a tree up and shove it back into the ground upside down. There were mining companies that were seeing things. There were um, uh, logging companies. That's the word I'm looking for. Logging companies, they were seeing something all around this area. The cannery, the fishing, the people on the boats, all of the fishermen were all seeing this very large, dark, hairy creature that was said to be very mean. Now, after the first post office was established in the 1920s, it was said, quote, the evil spirit or creature haunted the nearby mining camp of Chrome. Now, the indigenous people thought that the hairy man was more like a spirit than a flesh and blood creature, but that's because they would see it, then it would disappear, they would see it again, it would disappear, plus their people had been seeing it for decades, hundreds of years by this point, a hundred years by this point. So they thought it wasn't exactly flesh and blood because how could a creature still be out there after this long? But the next story, we have to jump ahead until 1931. This one's about a logger named Andrew Kamluck. Now he was found dead by his logging equipments and had been hit over the head with a huge piece of that logging equipment. Now the news story said, this was something that a man could not have lifted and swung. Because a lot of skeptics say, oh, he got in a fight with another logger. That logger just cracked him upside the head and accidentally killed him and then ran away. No, the news story from that time said the piece of equipment used to kill the man could not have been lifted and swung by a man. Now, when they found his body, there was blood on the crane, and he was a good 10 feet from it. It looks as if something or someone picked it up and, quote, bonked him over the head and tossed the heavy piece of equipment aside. All right, Kurt here. This is the only death with real facts that I can actually verify. So keep that in mind, but let's keep on keeping on. Now, during the 1940s, reports of bodies in and around Portlock began... Uh, they found them, um, they, they, basically the bodies, like the reports started appearing or, or happening. They started correlating, whatever you want to say. They started getting all these reports in the 1940s that bodies in and around Portlock that were found torn up in nearby rivers, lagoons, and trails near towns. Now, these bodies were said to be completely mutilated and essentially torn to shreds. So you might be saying, that's a bear. Yeah, bears can do that. That's what a lot of skeptics think, but they said that there was no evidence of claw marks or bite marks, anything that you would find from a bear mauling a human were not found on these bodies. Now, people also began disappearing out of nowhere and never returning home, but not one name is associated with any of these bodies, nor could I find any police reports. Now, it's the 1940s. Is there a chance it's a very small town? Is there a chance that... These police reports were only done on paper and they didn't survive the test of time? Yes, sure. But the news stories around that time were pretty, you know, in depth. You would think that one or two news stories would pop up about like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of bodies being ripped apart and thrown into the lagoon. I can't find anything about that. So huge grain of salt on that one, but... 
Another one that seems verifiable, but no name, is the story of a gold miner who headed out for the day and, quote, just disappeared. He was never seen again, and it was determined to be, quote, mysterious circumstances. Now, that one I can find news articles about, but remember, this is very rugged terrain and very easy to get hurt or killed by non-cryptid things. So, sure, that story's probably true, but it doesn't necessarily lean towards the hairy man yet. Now, around that same time, I did find one news article. It was a short piece about woodman, woodsman Tom Larson, who, quote, went out to chop wood for fish traps when he saw something large and hairy on the beach. He ran back home for his rifle. When he returned to the water's edge, the thing just stared at him. The story went on to say that Larson never could explain why he never, you know, shot at the creature. Good, don't fucking shoot a Bigfoot, not even the hairy man. Now, there's a lot of stories from fishermen, or tales, I'll put it that way, from fishermen around this same time, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, who say they see this thing on the banks of the rivers or the banks of the lake all of the time, and it can also swim. So now they're seeing a swimming Bigfoot that catches fish, does not give a shit when people are staring at him. He kind of stares back. Now, around, uh, let's see... Uh, around that same time, the late 1940s, there's another unverified story. I can't find any news stories about this, but it said on a number of sources that for the next 20 years, up to three dozen mangled bodies had turned up along rivers, trails, as well as floating out in the bay. These bodies were said to be completely mut- mutilated and essentially torn to shreds. Again, the quote-unquote experts say not resembling anything that a bear or wolf could or would do. Around that time, in the 50s, cannery workers refused to work unless there were armored guards, armed guards, not armored guards, that'd be weird, armed guards protecting the camp around the clock. Here's the problem. Yep, I can't find any old news stories, newspaper stories, anything. That's the 50s. Again, small town, I get it, so maybe, but I just don't know what to believe on this one. Now, there are numerous stories about unnamed hunters tracking moose, and when they would occasionally, like, come across this, you know, like, they're getting close to the moose, basically, they would stumble upon giant man-like tracks over 18 inches in length. One report that uh, they're, all right, they're closing in on the moose. They said there was, quote, signs of a struggle where the grass had been matted down. Then only the deep tracks of the man-like animal departing towards the high fog-shrouded mountains. No more, no more moose. Tracking a moose. Hey, there's a moose and uh, there's moose prints. Oh, and there's like some big footprints too. And then big rough area where everything's been matted down and then just even heavier big footprints going up into the mountains. Very interesting. But again, no names. It bums me out when I can't find names. Another story from 1949. The locals were too scared of the hairy man. They all left overnight, leaving behind all of their possessions never to return. Yeah, there's a lot of reports of still finding encampments and stuff like that around that area in Port Chatham with all the possessions still in them. Now, there are some skeptics that say... That was right around the time that a highway or a main road kind of like connected the former town to the latter town, basically the towns on either side of Port Chatham. And everybody was like, well, screw this crappy little town. I'm just going to go to the big town up the road. Again, no proof to that, but sure, I'll throw that in there for the skeptics. Then, 1956. A fisherman spotted the hairy man as he was anchoring his fishing boat on the beach at night. A biologist from Ketchikan had later found and took a photograph of huge human-like footprints on the same beach. Then, 1968, a goat hunter claimed to have been chased by a creature while he was hunting in the area, saying it was a large, hairy man, very ape-like, not a bear. 1973, three hunters took shelter there during a three-day storm and claimed that each night something walked around their tent on what sounded like only two feet, but they were too afraid to go outside. Don't blame them at all. Then, still, 1973, 
an Anchorage newspaper ran a piece on a retired school teacher who had taught in Port Chatham during World War II. She told of cannery workers who went into the mountains to hunt, doll sheep, and bear, but they just never returned. Search parties found no trace of them. Then rumors spread that a mutilated body, torn and dismembered in a fashion that didn't resemble wounds from a bear attack, had been swept by rains down the mountain and into the lagoon. Into the lagoon. But <clears throat> I don't have any proof for it. But it seems to me that this is just someone regurgitating tales that became almost like urban legends in the area by that time. It seems like a lot of the native people were simply having fun or regurgitating tales to make the news. Again, no proof, but that's what it seems like. Then in 1982, in the city of Dillingham, a, a hunting guide showed a picture of what he had taken on the, of the, uh, the hairy man, basically, standing on a mountain ridge. It had an approximate height of 10 feet and weighed around 750 pounds with long, reddish-brown fur. Then in July of 1999, along the banks of the Kisseralik, sure, Kisseralik River in, in Alaska, a group was able to take a photo of a pair of huge wedge-shaped footprints that they had noticed in the mud. These footprints were estimated to be about 12 to 14 inches long and 3 inches deep. They were approximated to be at least 6 feet apart. That's a good one. Then, same year, 1999. A black-haired, huge creature was seen standing on two legs in the cold bay of Bilkovsky. It stood about 14 feet tall and had the appearance of an ape with very long arms and legs. Uh, let's go back in time just a hair to 1990. I guess I didn't get them all in the same right order, sorry. 1990, an Anchorage paramedic was called out to aid a 70-year-old native who had suffered a heart attack but was incarcerated in the Eagle River Jail north of the city. While treating the man, the paramedic mentioned, uh, happened to mention that he had been hunting in the area of Port Chatham. The elderly man suddenly sat up, grabbing the medic by his shirt, very dramatic for someone who just had a heart attack, but sure, I'll keep reading, and said, did it bother you? Did you see it? Eh. Then, an article with Sally Ash, who was of native descent, who has lived in Nawalek for most of her life and continues to speak the na native language of, ooh, I'm going to get this one wrong, I already learned how to say it and I already forgot, Sugstun, I think, Sugstun. Her mother was born in Dogfish Bay near Port Chatham. She tells the reporter, Our people were nomadic, went by the seasons. Whatever was in season, they would have moved from one place to another. They went through Port Chatham, Dogfish Bay, Sildovia, Homer, even to Kodiak. It's not your typical everyday Sasquatch brute that they saw. No, this thing was more of a supernatural being. I think he is part human. He lived with the people and then didn't want to be around them anymore, so he moved to the forest, away from everybody. He started growing hair, and he looked like a Bigfoot. Scary. My uncles, my grandfathers, they all talked about him. They tell us that they live far away from the people. They don't mix with the people. Then, Sally uh, brought up this family story. She said, My brother went up to the lake. He was tying off his skiff. He started smelling something really bad in the bushes. So he opened it, moving the branches. Something's going on in here. He then looked in there. That's when he saw a man with his hands. In the back way, turned around, it looked like a man. But he was all hairy, and he looked really scary. So he and her cousin took off running and didn't want to be up there. He wasn't sure if it was Bigfoot, but there was a horrible smell. And she said, and I quote, Don't shoot them. Yes, you can shoot them, but you'll never kill them. One man tried to do it, but he just took the bullet and pulled it out of his chest. Oof. They asked uh, Sally if the um, this creature... Why did I... I know I wrote it down somewhere. How do you pronounce it? I apologize. Um, ah, here we go. The Nantinook, that's what they call it. The Nantinook is a solitary creature. Is it a he, a solitary Nantinook, or was there a clan of them? She said, I think it's a he. He's been living there for a long time. He's old, he's tall, he's strong, he's hairy. It lives in the woods, and you can tell when he's getting near. You can smell him. My mom used to talk about it a lot. She told stories of the Bigfoot, like in Dogfish area. Her and her brother would talk about Bigfoot, uh, how Bigfoot was around. They were getting too close to him, and they'd be nice to him, respect him, keep distance from him. They live with him, but not so close. He moved around. He was quick. She said that uh, Port Lock was a kind of creepy place. They tell us not to go out on a foggy day. That's when he's walking around. You could run into him, and you'd never even know what he might do. Then, in the October 2009 edition of the Homer, Homer Tribune, Nawalek 
elder Melania Helen Kell, who was born in Port Chatham in 1934 and seems to be the most reliable person to be talking to. Well, that's what they say in the Homer Tribune. She said that uh, her parents, along with the rest of the village, grew weary of people being terrorized by a creature called the Nantinook. Nantinook meaning half man, half beast. She said that many of the residents refused to venture into the surrounding forest and over time abandoned their homes in the village school and moved up the coast to Port Graham. Only the portmaster remained in Port Chatham, but the post office closed in 1950. Earlier records made by Port Lock Cannery Management showed that the sites have been vac- vacated once before. Kind of what I was talking about earlier. So let me just say it this way. Even if you filter out some of the more dubious regurgitated, unverified stories, however you want to word it. There does seem to be an aggressive Bigfoot living in the Port Chatham area. And it's been seen for over 100 years and even longer by the indigenous people. Now, you got to remember that these are experienced hunters and fishermen that know what bears look like. They all note this wasn't a bear. They all talk about the telltale Bigfoot stuff, like the whistles, the howls, the rock throwing, the smells, using tools, everything, how it looks, even the reddish brown hair. It's all Bigfoot-like and not bear-like at all. Now get this, though. The hairy man, he isn't the only thing that's living in that area. Because nearby, there's a lake called Lake Iliamna. And it has its own cryptid that has just as many, if not more, stories, more sightings. No killings, as far as I've found, but still. Now, Lake Iliamna has its own monster, not a monster. Uh, They call it Illy. But before I get to her, or more accurately, them, let me talk about the similarities between this lake and one you all better know, Loch Ness. Both are very deep. Both seem to be connected to the ocean through underwater caves, crevices, tunnels, something that seems to allow big creatures basically in and out of it. So here are some facts about the lake. Like, it's the largest lake in Alaska and one of the largest lakes in the country. It's very, in case you couldn't guess, it's very close to Port Chatham. It's, you know, a flying, a, a floating plane, float plane is what they call them, a, a plane right away from them. So it's very close to that, but... The largest lake in Alaska, one of the largest lakes in the country. The lake is 77 miles at its longest, has a maximum width of approximately 22 miles, so it's massive. Its deepest point is 988 feet, that's 301 meters, with an average depth of 144 feet. Now, Iliamna is located about 50 feet above sea level, but they think it's connected to the ocean. It goes on to say that uh, this is like, the official stuff, if you will, <clears throat> Ooh, the official stuff, if you will, about Lake Iliamna. Like most of Alaska, due to its remote location, access to Iliamna Lake is restricted most, most exclusively to the use of airplanes. Travel by float planes is the most common, as they can land directly onto the lake. No roads currently connect communities to, on the lake to the surrounding areas. However, during the summer months, it is possible to travel up the Kivchak River using small boats. The region surrounding the lake is very sparsely populated. Keep that in mind. The area is very sparsely populated, but there are, you'll hear, dozens of stories about Italy in this lake. Now, the earliest reports of a settlement in the region were the Russian fur traders in the 1790s. The lake itself was claimed by the Danaina people as their own territory until contact with the Russians, then after all that. The earliest reports of a monster living in the lake came from the native Tlingit people who tell stories of a creature referred to as the Gonakadet. I know I said that wrong. Gonakadet? Gonakadet. I don't remember how to say it already. It's the creature. Now, it was described as a large water-dwelling animal with the head and tail similar to that of a wolf, body like an orca, very similar to the Aklut, another possibly mythical creature. Now, the Ghana Kadet was depicted as a fish god and was recorded in pictographs along the Alaskan and British Columbian coasts. Other early reports of the monster came from the native Aleut people who tell stories of a creature that they call jig ig The fish-like monsters were reported to travel in groups and attack canoes. Now, this is very interesting because 
again, you'll hear it in a little bit, a, a story about multiple monsters, if you will. I hate using that term, creatures. And not just one, not just a Nessie, but a bunch of Nessies traveling in groups and attacking canoes. It went on to say that they would attack the canoes, would kill warriors. The creature was feared, but not hunted by the Aleut. That's important because if you know anything about the indigenous people of Alaska, they can still hunt orcas. They hunt orcas. They basically hunt anything that's in the ocean. So it's very telling that they wouldn't or they refused. They do not hunt this creature. Alrighty, so all these stories about the Illy sightings, they started getting out and uh, like a little bit here or there by those pilots on those float planes. They would be flying over and they'd be looking down and they'd be going, what the crap is that thing? So more and more of these stories start trickling out and more fishermen and pilots would take their float planes lower and lower and lower over the lake trying to see it. And they weren't disappointed either. So many pilots began reporting in sightings of large, dull, aluminum-colored fish. And I'm talking huge fish. Something that isn't supposed to live in the lake. And by the late 50s, there were dozens of reports of illy sightings. Throughout the 60s, same thing. Then, 1979, the Anchorage Daily News offered a sum of $100,000 to anyone who could provide conclusive evidence of the monster. Uh, I suppose I should note it here. That reward has not been claimed yet. All right, so like with the hairy man, let's kind of go through some of the eyewitness stories. 1942, Babes Aylesworth and Bill Hammersley were, uh, Hammersley, they were on a uh, direct flight over the lake traveling to the village of Iliamna. Now, Bush pilot uh, Aylesworth, now, he was flying what was a Stinson ferry plane. It was basically a small plane with flotation devices on the bottom. They were crossing over the, the dark water when he noticed some unusual specks in the water near an unnamed island in the middle of the lake. So they fly a little closer to it, and he was able to see that these were actually giant fish. So he's like, nope, screw that. I want everybody else to see this. He swirls the plane around for a closer look. Now, both of those people, Babe and Bill, were able to get a look on the second pass and described what they saw as dull, dull aluminum in color with heads that were broad and blunt. The width of their long tapered bodies was the same as that of their head and that the vertical tails slowly waved side to side. This is important because what people think it is in there, one of the big theories is that it's a whale or whales. Well, whale tails go up and down. Fish and reptile tails go side to side. So this very close encounter, very, very close encounter in 1942 already says, nope, it's not a whale. They said they uh, spiraled the plane down from 1,000 feet to 300 feet to get a better look. So remember, everything that they just saw was from 1,000 feet up and they could see it clearly. That's how big these things were. They soon saw that the length of 10 feet of the creature, what the pilot thought it was originally, was very low. They saw several dozen giant fish, and they said that these fish were easily longer than the plane's pontoons. And according to the men, they looked more like mini submarines than they did fish. They circled the area until the creatures disappeared in a surge of water. As the men continued on their journey, they were like, what the hell did we just see? They said it can't be a whale, no, you know, no tail movement. They know all of the fish in the area. These people were coming for that very reason. And they said those creatures never resurfaced for air. So whatever it was, it was big and possibly water breathing. Then 1947, uh, Bill uh, published a very short piece on the mystery fish, the same guy. Five years later, he's, or, yeah, five years later, he's still thinking about it. So he does a short piece on that fish, hoping that he can like entice other people to start investigating or come forward with reports, be like, hey, don't, don't think you're crazy. We saw something too. Then Larry Rost, a U.S. Coast and Geodetic survey pilot, came forward. Very experienced man, very intelligent man, said he was flying across Lake Iliamna in the fall of 1945 at a height of only 100 feet. Larry said 
He saw what he claimed to be a giant fish, more than 20 feet long, the color dull aluminum. 1963, a biologist reported seeing a 25 to 30 foot fish from overhead. It did not come up for air. Then this next one is an awesome story. 1967, there was a guy named Chuck Crapuchete or Crapuchette. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Chuck, we'll call him Chuck. He was an Alaska missionary. He saw the monster twice, twice, once. He was flying over in a float plane and he saw a large animal in the water. He got on the radio. He tried to call some other people around to say, hey, can you come over and see this thing too? But nobody got there in time. Now, one of his friends went trolling for it. Here's where it gets good. This guy took 5 16th stainless steel cable, put a number tuna hook on it. Take a look at it. It's a ginormous freaking fish hook. Like, I don't know, 6, 8, 12 inches long. I have no idea. It's a big freaking tuna hook. He baited them with caribou and tied them off the struts of his float plane. He was drifting. He was basically like sitting on the water, threw all that the, the fish bait and the uh, hooks into the water. He said he was drifting and sitting out on the floats. So he's sitting there out on the floats, not in the plane. When the plane gave a big jerk and knocked him off the floats. He said the plane was towed off and he barely made it back to shore. He walked for miles while the plane was towed around the lake. When he finally recovered his plane, three of the cables were gone. The hooks on one were straightened out. Like I said, these things have got to be, I don't know, eight to ten inches long. They look like a ginormous fish hook, and it was straightened out. They have no idea what caused that, but it had to have been freaking huge, and it wasn't like, oh, I got caught on a log underneath or something. No, This thing towed a plane around the lake, knocked this guy off his freaking plane. He had to swim back to shore knowing there's something huge under the water. That's freaking terrifying. All righty, then 1977, a veteran pilot named Tim Laporte, while flying over Pedro Bay nearby, spots a 12 to 14 foot fish. Now it's on the surface as it dove down, revealing a vertical tail. Laporte and his two passengers, one a visiting Michigan fish and game official, actually witnessed the fish, this giant arching splash that it went right back down. Now, Laporte says he remembers watching the animal's large vertical tail moving as the animal sound, moving as the animal sounded. I don't know what he means by that, but they, uh, they said that him and his passengers estimated the creature to be roughly 12 to 14 feet in length, dark gray or dark brown skin. Then moving forward, 1987, resident Verna Koliaha, Koliaha, whatever, reported seeing a large black fish with white stripes down its fin. 1988, several reports come through, all from locals citing the same thing, a large black fish with a fin swimming near the the surface, too large for anything in the lake. All right, that's the bulk of the sightings, but I actually wanted to play something for you guys about this fish, if I can. Let's see if it works. It was a calm day, and, and as I looked out and I saw something in the lake, and there was a, at least half a dozen people that had gathered around to see what was out there, and at that time, uh, I had my, my cell phone out, and I was recording in case something was to surface. Probably yeah. somewhere between three and 500 yards off the beach, there was something that made some pretty big wakes, and everybody there witnessed it, and I got it on a short video clip. All right, so it shows the island in the middle. At first, it doesn't look as if there's anything to see. Uh, Shut up. But then. All right, shut up. So it shows the island in the middle, and there's like a little hump in the background, but it could just be a wave. But then, no, this ginormous hump pops up, and then two, and then three humps, all connected together. If you would have said, hey, look at this awesome footage from the Loch Ness, I would have been like, dude, that is awesome Loch Ness footage. That's amazing. But no, it's from Lake Iliamna. And there's a lot of these stories. Let's see about this guy. Then it kind of sloped and it had a tail. Uh, and the head, the head looked like it could swallow you. All right, so there's another eyewitness to the same thing. But now I'm trying to find, here we go. A colleague of mine and I were flying back into a fish camp where we've been conducting research. Robin Levine. And we were on our way down. Flying. She's from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. And I saw something in the shallows. 
something I hadn't seen before. At first I thought it were two seals twisting together, and then I realized, no, it was one creature. Yes, she thought it was a beluga whale, but then she said, no, these things were connected. These weren't three or four creatures, they were one creature. It was then that I recalled the stories I'd heard, the stories that I dismissed years earlier about something in the water. And there's another story, if I can get to it. That suggests the Lake Iliamna creature is not alone. We saw three gigantic creatures. And these things were just absolutely huge. And I have no idea what they could have been. Rounded, slightly rounded, long, um, darkish, blackish gray. is well over 60 feet. This man, go. Gary Nielsen, go. was out on the lake with his wife. These things were awful big, and there was a lot of them. One clear afternoon in the late 90s, local businessman Gary Nielsen was out on the lake with his wife. My wife was looking over the side, and she screams, and she's on my side of the boat, in my lap, screaming at me to go faster, so I just automatically hit the throttle. Fast forward, and as I look back to where she was looking, there was these two heads, probably about that long, and about that wide, and that was just the heads. And they were traveling like that, and they were looking at us as we were going by. The heads were maybe two feet long, maybe longer, 16 to 18 inches wide, triangular shaped, very sleek looking, and the bodies were awful long, but I couldn't tell the body length because I was too busy trying to get into the shallow water. These things were big. All righty, so then about covers the stuff that the story that I really want to get to about the guy and his wife, and they saw numerous ones. When they got, to, it continues on. Basically, when they got to the shallows, they could they could look down and see numerous ones as they were getting to the shallows. So whatever this is, it's not just one. There's numerous creatures, I'll call it. There's numerous illies in Lake Iliamna. Now, most of the sightings in recent times take place near Pedro Bay and the fishing village of Iliamna. So if you want to check it out, they say that's the best place to go to see it. There's been a number of stories written about this one, about this creature, but um, here are a couple of older, almost paranormal news stories about Illy. This one came from 2019 inside one man's quest to photograph the elusive Iliamna Lake Nump. Lake Monster. The uh, fishermen had tried hooking it. Newspaper once offered $100,000 proof of existence, but so far no one has photographed the creature until this man, Palmer resident Bruce Wright, a former marine ecologist with the Marine Fisheries, marine fisheries Service, hopes to solve the riddle once and for all this summer. He plans to sink an underwater camera to the bottom of the sprawling and sparsely populated southwest Alaska lake that's the largest and one of the deepest in the state. People call Iliamna Lake an inland sea. It's 80 miles long with a rare population of freshwater harbor seals that scientists believe moved in from the ocean long ago and an old legend that something large lives within the 1,000-foot uh, depths. They said this could be an exciting new discovery. Residents from lakeside villages say there's no imaginary tales. The observations over the years are often consistent of huge aquatic creatures, often shark-like in, in appearance. It's just part of life out here. A lot of old-timers refused to even travel on the lake because of it. Two years ago, he and other village residents saw what looked like a group of creatures swimming on the surface for a few seconds. They were about a mile away when they spotted them through binoculars. The longest was very large, maybe 65 feet long. Others were slightly smaller. They were gigantic, but it didn't appear to be whales. I have no idea what we saw. There could be possible explanations for the sightings, says uh, Forrest Bowers, a biologist with the State Commercial Fisheries Division. Beluga whales often following salmon up the Kivichak River from the Pacific Ocean. Or maybe it's seals appearing extra large because of visual distortions. Then again, who knows? It's a big lake. There are likely things we don't know about big lakes like that. Now, Wright believes the animals are actually large sleeper sharks that can grow 20 feet long and far outlive humans. Like their better studied cousins, Greenland sharks, the planet's longest living vertebrate that can sometimes... Uh, remain alive for more than 300 years. They're somehow visiting or living in the freshwater lake. Now, some people believe it's sturgeon. Now, those can grow up to 20 feet long. Now, that's a huge theory. I'm going to pause the story for a second. That's a huge theory about the sturgeon. But again, there are there is no evidence 
that there are sturgeon living in the lake. They go on to say there's definitely something down there. And uh, there's by a man named Mark Steiger, who's a retired colonel and former chief aviation officer for the Alaskan Army National Guard. He owns a summer house in Iliamna. Uh, five years ago, he offered help Wright find the animal by occasionally fishing for it. Steiger didn't think he'd find anything unusual, but then one day in July 2017, he and his brother-in-law pulled up the heavy-duty 200-foot long line that they stretch across the bottom, the lake bottom after baiting 14 hooks with salmon heads. A big 4-inch stainless steel snap was gone, along with a thick nylon braided cord holding the hook. Another metal snap was bent. One nylon cord was sawed in two. A second hook was missing. The cord was abraded in two spots. It had been cut with animal's teeth. A 30-pound anchor, 38-pound anchor, set on the, on the lake bottom to hold the long line was dragged 50 yards. That's insane. They said that the line was tangled into a messy ball. He doesn't believe the damage was the work of seals. The ones he's seen are too small, and the line was too deep for a boat to hit it. At that point, I decided I don't want to catch the thing anymore because there's truly something here. And if it's a sleeper shark, it may be the oldest living creature on the planet. Sean Brennan, a University of Washington researcher who studies the lake seals, said he wouldn't rule out a cleverly determined seal as the culprit. They eat salmon, and one reported weighed nearly 200 pounds. I don't know. These seals are really strong swimmers, and they definitely have sharp teeth. 1959, Sports of Field magazine reported that something had ripped away tackle as a group fish for the animal, snapping a stainless steel cable like it was a thread, and snatching moose meat bait. In 1980, the Anchorage Daily News offered $100,000. You already know that. The award would have been worth more than $300,000 today, but nobody won it. Robin Levine, an Anchorage anthropologist, said she and a colleague got a good look at an odd creature in the summer of 2008 as their water taxi flew low over the lake on a clear, calm day. It looked like a grayish fish, maybe 15 feet in length, with a long head, prominent tail, and fins on its side, swimming in shallow water. It was kind of like twisting, like stirring up the sandy bottom. At first I thought it was two seals twisting, but then I realized it was one animal. It was definitely more fish-like than whale-like. Uh, Tim Laporte, I uh, remember seeing it in July of 1977 as he and his passengers banked the, the lake surface. The group spotted something very fish-like for a few seconds, maybe 15 feet long, based on the size of a nearby skiff. It arched its back and hit the water, which was glassy calm, and its wake radiated out from the big splash. We saw a great big tail going sideways, back and forth, going down. I don't believe it's a whale, and it didn't act like the seals we've seen for years, so who knows? So that's one, just one news story about someone going out to try and capture it. Unfortunately, no update. Let me click on the other one. I'm not going to read the whole other one, just a little bit. The pride of Bristol Bay, catching the Iliamna Lake Monster. Not a monster. I was a skeptical, but I am not skeptical anymore. They said that on a calm September day, a group of moose hunters sat in their skiff on the Iliamna, Iliamna Lake on the Alaska Pen Peninsula. The men noticed what looked like two big sunken logs beneath their boat, but didn't think much of it. They focused on scanning for moose and watching a family of swans floating nearby. Suddenly, one swan vanished underwater. In a matter of seconds, the rest of the flock was dragged under. The hunters watched in horror and fascination as what they thought had been sunken logs fed on the birds. One was the length and width of their 18-foot skiff and had eyes the circumference of soccer balls. They said the creature looked like giant northern pike. Bruce Wright, a marine ecologist and apex predator specialist, recorded, recorded his account. It's just one of many stories of what people have dubbed the Iliamna Lake Monster. He's not a big fan of cryptobiology, but as a scientist who has studied everything from bears to sharks, he finds the story of the monsters fascinating. The lake interests him as much as any mysterious based beast it may hold. What's so intriguing to me is the lake itself. Five to eight million Adult sockeye salmon came back to Lake Iliamna each year. Come back to Lake Iliamna each year. Uh, that goes on to talk about the lake. I'm not going to talk about that. That's about it. That's about this one. It's the same thing. Uh, they're talking about that uh, 2017 entanglement with the lines and everything. So, yeah, skeptics, like I was saying, skeptics, they want to say the possible explanation, and I say big possible with one big caveat, because, again, no evidence of white sturgeon residing in Lake Iliamna. But... Not but, including the fact that fish and wildlife have actually investigated the lake thoroughly for these white sturgeon. And not one sturgeon has ever been found in the lake. With that said, though, here's the reason that many people think the creature of Lake Iliamna is a sturgeon. Marine Fishery Commission say white sturgeons are the largest freshwater fish in North America. They can weigh over 1,500 pounds, be 20 feet in length, live for over 100 years. Sure. 
Now, many people have reported that the propellers were damaged by what looked like teeth marks, but they say it might actually be caused by a boat running over the back of a sturgeon at the surface because the backs have teeth-like armor plating, which can easily make a propeller appear as it had been chewed or attacked. So that does explain some of this stuff. Again, no sturgeon live in Lake Iliamna. There's also been stories of people being knocked out of their boats as it rammed and never resurfacing. Now, this can be attributed to a sturgeon's tendency to jump out of the water, accidentally hitting small uh, boats in the process, and dying as a result of the harsh freezing conditions in the lake itself. They go on to say that sturgeons are bottom feeders and dwell at the bottom of the lakes, rivers, and oceans. Remember, Lake Iliamna, maximum depth, 1,000 feet, could explain why they're never seen or rarely seen, and when they do, they're ginormous. But to reiterate to you skeptics, no evidence of white sturgeons residing in Lake Iliamna. All right, let me make sure I didn't miss any stories about this. Uh, there's actually this really cool handy-dandy guide about Illy sightings. So let me cruise through and make sure I didn't miss anything. 1942, Babe and Bill talked about that one. 1963, biologists reported seeing a 25 to 30 foot fish coming over from overhead. It did not come up for air. Talked about that one. 67, ah, that's the Chuck story, the awesome story. Talked about that one. 77, pilot while flying over Pedro Bay spotted a 12 to 14 fit, foot fish on the surface as it dove down, revealing a, a vertical tail. Vertical tail, sturgeons don't have that. Uh, 87, resident Verna reported seeing a large black fish. Talked about that. 88, several locals report the same sighting from the water and land. Talked about that. 2017, Kakonak Village residents saw a creature one mile offshore that was estimated about 50 to 60 feet in length. The animal blew like a whale and had several smaller ones following. Didn't talk about that one, so that's a good one. So there is something big in the lake. There is no doubting about it. No doubting about it. But no one to this day knows exactly just what the crap it could be. All righty, with that, I'm not done. Nope. Surely it can't get any weirder than those, right, Kurt? Well, <laughs> how about a pterodactyl or pterosaur or pteranodon? A dinosaur, a flying dinosaur over Alaska. How about that? Because guess what? There are numerous stories about seeing a flying pterodactyl to this day. And it's not as crazy as you might think. Because I've done episodes about these, these pterodactyls, pteranodons, whatever you want to call them, before when they call them thunderbirds. It's been seen in and over Alaska by the indigenous people for centuries. Now, a lot of skeptics say, oh, it's just the lore or God or stories to scare the children. But it might be more than that. Because according to Alaskan villagers in the Togiak and Manakatak, I think it's how you pronounce it, villages, a huge bird with a 14-foot wingspan has been seen not once, but numerous times. Now, some skeptics say, oh, it's probably a stellar sea eagle, which is a species that's indigenous to Japan but may have flown to Alaska. It has a wingspan of 8 to 10 feet. But here's the problem. Everyone that talks about this thunderbird, I'll just call it thunderbird, says... It's not 8 to 10 feet long. It's 14 foot long wingspan or longer. These things are huge. Not only that, it's much larger and it's brown, all brown. Picture a pterodactyl in your head. That's what these people are reporting. There's a man named Moses. He's a 43-year-old heavy equipment operator from Togiak, 40 miles west of Manakatak. i got to stop saying those because I know I'm saying them wrong. I apologize. He said he saw this bird flying towards him from about two miles away. And uh, as he's sitting there working on his tractor, he says, at first I thought it was one of those old-time otter planes. Instead of continuing towards me, it banked to the left, and that's when I noticed it wasn't a plane at all. This bird was something huge. The wings looked a little wider than the otters, maybe as long as the otter plane. Now the bird flew behind a hill and disappeared. He got on the radio and warned people in Togiak, to tell their children to stay inside, to stay away, because this thing was big and it was heading right for them. Then another sighting happened by pilot John Booker. He said before his sighting, he was incredibly skeptical of reports of a giant big eagle. 
He said, this thing was two or three times the size of a bald eagle. I didn't put any thought into it. But once, flying back into an ac attack, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, he looked out his left window and a thousand feet away, he said, there's this big bird. The people in the plane all saw it. He's huge. He's huge. He's really, really big. You wouldn't want to have your children out. Two people saying, keep your children safe. January 16, 2018, another sighting happened. Now, this one came on the Facebook page of the Janua or Janu, I don't know, Community Collective. The witness was Tabitha Bauer. She described seeing the large bird as she approached a movie theater in her community. I was driving by the movie theater in the valley, and there was a huge black bird flying above the road. The wingspan had to be at least 20 feet. It was almost as wide as the road itself. I've lived here all my life. I've never seen anything like that. It freaked me out. It was not a raven nor an eagle. This isn't a joke. This thing was huge, almost the size of a small airplane. Did anyone else see it? Now, she went on, uh, later went on to tell the uh, Juno Empire that uh, she thought that there had been raindrops or that there had been raindrops on her windshield and that as she turned on the wipers, that's when she noticed the large bird above her car. Judging that wingspan was roughly that of the highway itself. Now, she, she said she slowed down to observe the animal. She judged that it was flying in the direction of a nearby Mendenhall Glacier, and she said it was, quote, the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was very concerning. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, it happened just before sunset around 4 p.m. local time. She said, yeah, I know it sounds nuts. I've been getting a lot of crap on Facebook about it like I'm crazy, but I wanted to post in it in case anyone else had seen it. Now, other people in the area, they described their encounters with the large bird, some of them dating back a, like a decade or two. It's not the first time that a Thunderbird, I'll just say, made headlines. Here are a couple of news stories about the Thunderbird sighting. Again, I'm not going to read the whole things, but I'm going to read a little bit about them. Bird mistaken as plane seen in parts of Alaska. A giant winged creature like something out of Jurassic Park has been sighted several times in southwest Alaska in recent weeks. This was in October 2002. A Dillingham pilot said he saw the creature while flying passengers. He calculated his wingspan matched the length of his wings on a Cessna 207. That's about 14 feet long. The uh, one sighting occurred on the morning of October 10th. Uh, another sighting a little bit after that, Nikolai something that name I can't say. He said he saw the creature out of the, the window of a plane. It looked like an eagle and was as large as a little super cub. The airplane, basically. The light aircraft, yeah, it's huge. I'm not certain, I'm not certainly of anything aware with a 14-foot wingspan that's been alive in the past 100,000 years, said a federal raptor specialist in John, in, in Janua, Janu, Janua. Uh, the Daily News has been besieged with emails, including one from the Netherlands. The online news magazine Drudge Report posted links. A San Diego FM radio program talked it up. Letterman even joked about it. They said that uh, people are calling from around the world basically to kind of make fun of everybody. That's not what this is about. So, again, don't, don't freak out on people when they actually are brave enough to go forward with weird things that they're citing. Uh, this one, uh, same time, 2002, a bird the size of a small plane was recently said to have been seen flying over southwest Alaska, puzzling scientists. Same thing, basically the same news story. And this one comes from February 2018 from the Janu, Janua Empire, the, the newspaper. According to several eyewitness reports, a bird with a wingspan nearly the width of a Mendenhall Loop Road has been started, spotted in the Mendenhall Valley. Uh, this talks about the one that I just talked about from Tabitha Bauer. She said it was a giant, massive jet black bird with a short tail flying level with treetops over Mendenhall Loop Road towards her. Said the bird flapped its wings, soared a little higher, and flew as a fast clip over her car about 50 feet in the air. I looked up right at that point. There was a huge, gigantic black bird flying right above my truck. It was basically following the roadway along the treetops. I slowed down to try to get a better look at it. It was heading towards the glacier. The, swing, the wingspan was almost as wide as the road, as I've already told you. The body of itself had to be at least six to eight feet. Another woman named Diane went out to smoke a cigarette near her Lemon Creek home, noticed that all the birds in the area were excited. All you heard was the whooshing sound in my trees. I went inside and grabbed a flashlight. It was so large I couldn't even get an outline of what type of bird this was. It sounds crazy, but it was huge. I don't even go camping anymore because of the size of this bird. 
Both of these accounts sound similar to the 2002 one that we already talked about. Yeah, it keeps going on and talking about the rest of the ones. So there you go. A dinosaur, a freaking pterosaur, a thunderbird has been seen over Alaska around the same area as Lake Ileana, which has Illy, which is nearby to Port Chapman, which has the hairy man. That's insane. But let me tell you, there is one more creature out there to talk about, but that's probably going to be put on to the 200th episode because I'm already over the length of this episode. So for you guys, which one is the hardest to believe? I got no problem believing in Illy or the hairy man. Look, Alaska is huge. Like I said, it's vast forests and lakes. So yeah, none of that is a stretch. Um, that The lake Iliamna, they think it connects to the ocean through crevices or caves. I don't remember saying that, but I, I there was a little snippet that I have somewhere on here. Um, they think it connects to the ocean. So it's very easy for something very large to go out there and come back anytime it wants. But uh, considering there have been Thunderbirds kind of spotted all around the world, even by a listener, who's to say there aren't still a few around? Whether that is just an unknown bird that is just ginormous, or if it's an actual pterodactyl. There is something huge out there, something bigger than even the biggest birds. And you got to remember, again, these are people that know what the animals in that area look like. They see eagles all the time. They even saw that big um, Japanese bird. They've seen those. And they said, no, this is bigger. It's a lot bigger. It's double the size of an eagle. And you might say, well, eagles aren't that big. Oh, yes, they are. They're freaking big. Wingspans, crazy big. So whatever this thing is, it's been seen by locals, not crackpots, locals who want nothing to do with the damn thing, and are all said like, oh, God, protect the kids because this thing could take them. We'll never see them again. Absolutely crazy. I love it. Uh, I absolutely love finding out about little towns like this. Like, why aren't more shows going up to Port Chatham and just hunting for the hairy man out there? Not hunting like, let's shoot him because don't fucking shoot hairy man. Like, you don't sh fucking shoot Bigfoot. But you know what I mean? Like, why aren't they looking for him out there? It seems like it's a very easy one to find. Yeah, it seems a little bit more violent than some of the other Bigfoot, but it seems like he'll come find you, basically. Stay out on the boat. Even if this thing can swim, you're going to see it coming at you. Keep, you know, keep your flear pointed at the water. You know, you'll see it coming at you. But I don't understand why this isn't a more of a hot Bigfoot hotspot. Maybe it is, and I just don't know about it. I know there's been a couple of, like, shows or YouTube shows kind of that have gone out there to look for it, but it seems like it'd be a bigger location for Bigfoot is all I'm saying. Same thing with Illy. Seems like there's a lot of these things. So just stay out there, camp out on a boat, bring a boat, drop it off by an airplane or helicopter or whatever, some big boat. Just stay in the middle of this lake looking for this thing for a season. Why not just a season? There's gotta be like the, the, the prime season where it's not all like horrendous weather. So just stay for the season and try and find this freaking thing. Use scientific equipment to prove the paranormal. I've said it before and I'll say it again every freaking time. All righty. Like I said, the last creature that I'm going to be talking about for Alaska, I'll probably put on the 200th episode. I was going to put it on this one, but I knew it was going to run a little long and I wanted to make sure that it gets its just desserts. Um, so, with that, once again, I'm your host, Kurt Samig, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Nah, I'm your hero, Yili.